Hello, and welcome to the My Heart and Mind podcast, where it's all about creating the feel good mindset so you can make the most of every moment and reap the benefits of getting the most happiness out of life. And now, over to your host, Sally Crawley. I'm Sally Crawley. I have the heart of a warrior and I love cats, coffee and cars. Together, we're going to explore the art of living happy after a cardiac event or a heart health diagnosis. This show is about helping you to get your emotional power back, to gain control of your life, your mind and your body. After a heart attack, cardiac arrest or when living with heart disease, it's not just your physical body that has life altering changes and needs rehabilitation. Your emotions and your world can be in turmoil too. My show focuses on your mindset, your thoughts and your feelings, so you can feel good now. It's about supporting you to make the lifestyle changes that will allow you to love the life you live. Quick disclaimer, if you have any concerns about your health or your heart, then get medical advice immediately. My work is not intended to replace conventional medicine. It is complimentary. Welcome to episode seven of the My Heart and Mind podcast. It's my second season and it's a lot later than I anticipated. But like many of you, the current pandemic has changed life in so many different ways. My plans definitely during 2020 have never been what I thought they'd be. Here in the UK, though, we're approaching spring and it's hopeful that with the vaccination process plan in place, lockdown will be lifted a little and we'll be able to be more social. Last season was an introduction to the mindset framework that I believe is needed to support cardiac health management. This season is going to include some interviews from some people who have experienced heart health issues, as well as some of the solo actionable episodes that will help you learn the art of living happy. Today's interview is with Sanjay Shah. He made a massive difference to my state of mind during the early days of my recovery. I was really low, I was crying all the time, and I really couldn't understand how I was ever going to feel better after my heart attack. He was a random stranger, and he did an act of random kindness. For him, a series of life challenges culminating in a heart attack by the age of 42 contributed to some hard and fast lessons for Sanjay in how to live a more fulfilled life without sacrificing career, relationship and health. He experienced his second heart attack whilst working out in a gym and got to see the inside of the state of the art Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. He explains what he means by his saying, are you living to die or dying to live? And Sanjay talks about his challenges in making lifestyle changes to reduce his risk factors. We talk about how his third heart attack, while smaller than his previous ones, it was made a much bigger impact on his life. And he shares with us his top tips that helped his recovery and talks about emotional intelligence. And he keeps it simple by using a car as a metaphor so it's easy to understand. And if you stay to the end, you'll hear about his controversial thoughts. So let's meet Sanjay Shah. Hi, Sanjay. I'm really, really pleased to have you on the show today. Um, thank you for joining us. And as you know, you are very pivotal pivotal in my life and my recovery after a heart attack. So what I'd like to start with is, could you tell me about your life before your cardiac event? I, uh, uh, yes, of course. So I guess I was a typical uh a person in the sense that I had a, a job and a career and uh, uh, I was doing the best I could. Uh, what had happened in my life prior to the heart attack, which I believe was significant, is uh, I sailed through school uh, and yeah, I did really well. Uh, and then I went to university. I went to dental school. And uh, that's where it started to kind of fall apart a bit because um I realized that uh, I didn't really want to continue with that. Uh, but now it started, I couldn't see any other options. Uh, and then uh, in the second year of dental school, uh, I failed one of the exams purely because I didn't put in enough work. And uh, 
that meant the end of that uh, kind yeah. of pathway, uh, really, which uh, I was okay with, but uh, people around me uh, were obviously a bit disturbed, especially because I'd done well until that point. And so that took a change intact. And then I went to university again uh, after a short break uh, to do uh, another degree. And then I went into a career of accountancy. And then I got made redundant two years into that, which meant the end of that second life uh, as well. And I didn't know what to do. So I ended up uh, joining the family business just um, to do something and ended up working a lot more than I planned to within that business because my dad's uh, illness took a turn for the worse. And uh, uh, eight years later, that business got sold. And uh, that was my kind of escape from uh, uh, that career. And uh, during those intervening years, I'd learned a lot. Uh, that, that business was a retail pharmacy. And I'd realized that on the whole, people came in month after month after month with their prescriptions. The prescriptions didn't really change. And what that meant was they weren't really getting better, but they were still taking the drugs. The one thing that did change was for several of them, they started to take more and more drugs. And that was to counteract the side effects of the drugs that were supposed to heal them. So I, with all of that, I realized that uh, medicine wasn't really the answer uh, to uh, solving our health uh, issues. Uh, and so uh, that became significant later on because I retrained uh, whilst I was working there in uh, some therapies. And when that business find, uh, was sold, I decided to go into that profession. And um, having worked all my life up till then, uh, I really didn't have any idea how to run a business. And so the first business, uh, there were four of us, three of us vastly unexperienced at running a business because we were all employees before. And the fourth one, who also came from a corporate career, uh, was supposed to have that money, but as it turned out, it didn't apply it. And that business sank very quickly with lots of debts. And uh, I started all over again on my own. And over the next six years, I worked pretty hard doing what I had to do, got phenomenal reviews from people I worked with for the work that I did, but the business still wasn't making much money, which meant I worked harder and harder to try and make it profitable. And in 2006, I got to a point where I decided I'd had enough and uh, I was about to quit, but I got persuaded uh -huh. to carry on. And uh, that was the summer of uh, 2006. Uh, and uh, uh, I carried on, but reluctantly. And January 2007, I had my oh, heart attack, which stopped me everything really uh, at that point. And I like to stress, it was what's called a silent attack. So I wasn't even aware that I'd had the initial uh, heart attack when I had it, too, because it happened overnight, as is quite often the case. It's just that I felt unwell in the morning, went to A&E because the doctors weren't open, and, uh, and my partner drove me to A&E just to uh, kind of make sure I was okay. And they obviously picked up something from what I said, because the next thing they told me to do was sit down and not move for the next three hours or so whilst they did some tests uh, and uh, then I was taken off to a ward to wait uh, the results of the test and about 4 p.m uh, the consultant came in and apologetically said that uh, I'd had a heart attack which uh, really shocked me and I became quite tearful because uh, uh, immediately I knew my life had changed. Yeah, it's a very emotional and, thing and uh, you know, next I wouldn't be going home. <laughs> I'd had to, I had to stay behind, and that made me even more emotional because um, now I was in a ward uh, with three other people that I didn't know, and trying to really get a grasp of what was happening in my head. Uh, and four days later, I had the stent uh, fitted, and uh, a few days later. Uh, I came out of hospital and started the rehab process. And that's the how that uh, first uh, uh, attack happened. But prior to that, I was what I call a hard worker, doing the right thing, just getting the wrong yeah, results. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like it was an incredibly but, stressful uh, number of years building up to that as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, I suspect there's millions of people 
uh, just in this country, let alone the rest of the world, who work very hard at what they do, who are passionate about what they do, who are good at what they do, they're still not getting the result that they expect or they wanted when they started their uh, journey. Uh, and that was typically... So how did that first heart attack affect you and your life after that? Um, quite simply, initially it brought me to a stop because I had to take some time off. And although at that time I didn't realize it, fundamentally it mm -hmm. saved my life. And I really mean that. So tell me a bit more about that. Uh, but at that, yeah, so, so at that time, when it stopped me, uh, the, as people who have a, any kind of major illness uh, experience, the, the, there's, a, you know, at the moment of that illness hitting, you start to think about the future and say, so what hope is there for the future? Because everything up till that point that you'd planned and you'd done hadn't worked. You still have this thing ago, which was going to change the very nature of your life. And uh, for me, uh, it gave me a chance to take some time off. Uh, I was fortunate. I had some insurance in place, which uh, uh, paid out uh, because of the, that heart attack. And uh, I could have paid off my mortgage with that, uh, but I didn't. I used that money to uh, really go to America to uh, go through some more uh, and superior training to what was available in the UK. And I came back and I started working in the business that I had, that, was, that I'd been working very hard in, but now I knew I couldn't work that hard. So I had to work in a different way. So one, it got me to reevaluate what life was about. What was my life about? Why was I here? Because I was 40, I wasn't even 42 when the heart attack occurred. I was before my birth. And it's like, I'm not ready to die yet, but why on earth am I here anyway? You know, it, it, suddenly the purpose of my life took on a very different meaning. And uh, I started asking questions, which most people don't until they have something like this occur. Uh, and other people who don't have something like this either never ask or they ask quite late on in life uh, or through some other major incidents in their life. It could be a divorce, it could be losing their job or in a right now in this uh, climate of the pandemic it could be somebody that they know has uh, passed away through the pandemic and they start to really question why they're here doing what they're doing and is it all so worth it was a real life-changing event for you on many levels uh, completely and utterly not you know not immediately it, it's not like a, everything changed uh, overnight on the outside but on the inside, everything did change uh, in an instant. And that instant was, I'm sorry to tell you, you yeah, had a heart attack. Yeah. That, 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 I just remember that moment. So you mentioned that it was your first heart attack. Um, and ha yeah. So you obviously made a lot of life changes and uh, improved your lifestyle, etc. So tell me, when was the second heart attack? That was... Uh, that was... Um, I'm trying to remember the dates now. <laughs> that was eight, eight right. years later. Uh, and I'd made a lot of changes. Um, my life was far happier. I was doing something that I absolutely loved doing, working with, pe with people that I loved being around. And uh, to all intents and purposes, life was much better. And things were working for me uh, by that stage. So that second heart attack, was a bit of a shock. It was literally a bolt right. out of the blue. Uh, with the first one, there were some warnings in the sense that there'd been a you know couple of weeks of uh, slight breathlessness and other things, which at that time I didn't know were warning signs for the heart attack. It, they were basically signs of being. Were you aware of that breathlessness before you had that first heart attack, or was it a when you hindsight being you know twenty twenty? I, I was aware that I wasn't feeling well, but literally only a couple of days before the heart attack, uh, going up and down the stairs, I became a bit, mm -hmm. bit breathless. Uh, but I had um, what I thought was toothache, uh, and I thought, well, I just need to go and see the dentist. And it wasn't that bad. So I wasn't in a rush to make yeah. an appointment. Uh, what I know now is uh, that can be a sign of angina. Exactly. I didn't know it at that time. Like you live and learn, as I say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Your second heart attack was a bolt out of the blue. 
I, I was working out with a personal trainer that I'd been working with for about a year. I loved, I literally loved those sessions that were working uh, in uh, the gym that she worked in. Uh, and we were going through a training session when uh, during one of the rigorous exercises, I suddenly realized I don't feel well. And I remember saying to her, uh, can I just stop? And I stopped. And then I went to the loo. I came back. I still wasn't feeling well. And I, and um, we both got a bit concerned. I decided to phone the ambulance. And they came within about 15 minutes and uh, started to do some tests whilst uh, they were also talking uh, to the control center, wherever that was. And uh, I remember it clearly because there were two of them and they started, and I was uh, in one part of the city, uh, which is uh, about eight miles from where I live. And so the nearest hospital was the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. And that was the uh, uh, version of the hospital, which is the one that's there now, the new version, the new building that they've built, the ultra state of the art hospital. And that was probably about one and a half to two miles away. And the one that I'd been in with the first heart attack was probably about six, seven miles away across the city centre. And they were debating which hospital to take me to. And I remember internally thinking, will you just yeah, make yeah. up your mind? <laughs> and they just take me yeah, to the nearest one. And I, think I to, uh, and I actually said to them uh, that, just take me to the QE. Uh, and something changed because they did. And they phoned and you know, did whatever they did. And the next thing, I'm um, being taken into the ambulance and blue lighted to the QE. Uh, and uh, they'd obviously given me something to, uh, kind of, I guess, sedate me or calm me down a bit. Uh, uh, what I didn't know was as soon as we got to the QE, I'm being rushed into theatre. And I remember somebody saying to me, we have to take you into the theatre right now because you're having an incident. Right. And uh, um, next thing I know, we're going through the stenting process. And those of you who haven't who are listening in but have, uh, haven't been through a stenting process, it's not done under general anaesthetic. You're sedated, but you're fully aware of what's going on. And uh, this time, uh, I got rolled in. It was very different because this is ultra-modern, state-of-the-art facility. The first time I remember being these mass people around me, several of them, and me being sedated. And when you're sedated, it does strange, strange things to your uh, thinking. And I remember thinking, they're trying to kill me. And, you know, oh, please gosh. just let me out of here. I'll come back. <laughs> the opposite. They were trying to save uh, your life, wasn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it shows the crazy things that go on <laughs> under these things. But this time, it, it's like, uh, literally, I, I felt like I was wheeled onto the deck of uh, the oh, Star yeah. Trek Enterprise. <laughs> In, there were all these screens. They were, you know, it just looked modern. Didn't look like many people. And they all seemed to be behind these uh, screens and consoles. And so when they started the procedure, there were only two people near me, one behind me uh, who was uh, monitoring, uh, I guess, my vital signs and, you know, breathing and stuff. And uh, the second was the surgeon. And that was it. The others were at a distance. And when they spoke, I could hear voices from the distance, but everybody seemed to be doing things on these machines. Uh, and uh, uh, very different procedure. Uh, but uh, anyway, I kind of, that went through about an hour uh, or so later, I don't know the exact time, but I, I, I was out and I stayed in hospital for a few days. What was different about that was that was a much bigger heart attack right. than the first one. And I could have had major damage, but I was in the operating theater within an hour of the first sign. So that was really important to be able to get in there that yeah. quickly. And uh, uh, they saved my life. Uh, you know, this this is the NHS, so that sort of work. They are absolutely superb. They're probably one of the best, if not the best in the world. And uh, uh, I came out of that, but I was shaken because everything seemed to be okay. I was doing okay. I was quite fit and get healthy by that stage of the felt. And then suddenly this heart attack, uh, which was much bigger than the first one. And could have caused uh, quite a lot of damage to the heart. As it is, I got away with minimal damage again. Right. And even the doctors, because I remember talking to one of them, when they found out I'd had a prior incident, they were a bit surprised that uh, my heart was doing as well as it was doing. And they, uh, 
uh, well, obviously, you know, kind of uh, thinking, oh, you know, what? How did this happen? What I know now, which I didn't know during uh, before the first heart attack, is the work that I did in emotions was instrumental uh, to do that because when I was being blue lighted into the hospital, I remember at the first one when they said, "I'm sorry to say you had a heart attack," thinking, "I don't want to die." And lying in the theater with these mass people around me thinking, I don't want it up because I haven't mm. lived. In the last seven or eight years prior to the second attack, I'd lived, I'd done things which I'd never thought of doing before. I'd, I'd dreamt about them, but I never got around to doing them. I'd traveled, I'd, uh, I loved it. Uh, you know, I was doing a job where I was getting paid for having fun and working with great people. Uh, and because of my nature, although it was therapeutic at that time, it wasn't kind of going in circuit, tell me about your past. It was working at a very different level where people made dramatic recoveries from uh, the troubles that they were having. And uh, uh, I loved it. I was actually living my life day to day. And uh, the, the reason I state that is uh, I have a saying, uh, are you waiting to die one day? Oh, are you dying to live oh, every lovely. day? I like that. I'm definitely dying yeah. to live and, every day. <laughs> yeah. And the people who have had a diagnosis, like a heart attack or cancer or whatever else, maybe even COVID nowadays, they're dying to live every day. They wake up each morning dying to live, make the most, because any day could mm, be the last that's day. That's very, very true. And uh, that realisation that you're mortal, that any day today could be the last day, means you don't fuck around doing stuff which is meaningless. You can still do it, but you've got a greater awareness of it. And those of us who become really aware of it make changes so that all of that stuff that doesn't need doing, you give to somebody else. Uh, and uh, you know, you'd rather pay them than get caught up in doing it yourself. And uh, I'm not saying it's easy, you know, I couldn't afford to uh, give away a lot of the stuff that I was, but I also knew that I, if I didn't, life wouldn't be worth living because I'd be back yes. into where I was before, which is working very hard, but at the end of the day, maybe having two weeks holiday in the year, and what's the point of doing all of that when there are other 50 weeks, you're just kind of slugging your heart out, uh, literally, uh, to just mm. make ends meet. It sounds like you're really kind of uh, trying um, to live the life that you were worried that you might not get, you know, live the life that you yeah, love. That kind absolutely. Of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd worked with several people who were diagnosed with terminal illnesses, some of whom passed away, some of whom recovered. And what I learned from them was the different attitude they had towards each day. They weren't getting caught up in the small stuff that didn't mean anything. And uh, I learned how to do that. And the skills that I learned in America uh, also helped me do that in a far more dramatic fashion yeah. than I'd ever imagined. And uh, uh, so when that second heart attack came, I was lying in the hospital, uh, uh, right, not in the ambulance rather, as they're uh, taking me to, uh, to the hospital, and I was at peace, I in mm. acceptance, that if this was it, if this was it, if I never saw any of my loved ones again, it was okay. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing, isn't it? About uh, living, and being in it, yeah. not yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. 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 And paradoxically, with the work I do, that put me in a high state of energy, which meant that probably is the reason why I got to hospital and they were able to work. And I was in a state in which there was minimal damage by that state by the time they got yeah. to work on me. So it sounds to me that actually having the two heart attacks has helped you focus on being able to make the most out of life and helping other people. Because yeah, uh, absolutely. I am, uh, my whole life got redefined. And uh, that wasn't the end because 18 months later I had my third heart attack. And I see that as a tap on the shoulder because it was a small attack. I was on my own. I had to make decisions about calling the ambulance. and. You know, the same thing again, I got, got into the hospital, the few day, I think it was a couple of days later, they did the same thing and I came out. Uh, but the key thing about that for me was it was a tap on the shoulder 
thing. Are you paying attention? Did you learn yes. the lessons? I think the universe that I made definitely other... does that sometimes, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, and I, and I so I made more changes when I came out to the point at which I was working very little uh, and really cut back on the hours, uh, cut back on the people I was working with, uh, cancelled courses, did, did stuff smaller and smaller and had more mm -hmm. time off. And paradoxically, my business started to boom. As I worked less. Ah, it's better. interesting, isn't it? Because it's not about always doing more, isn't it? <laughs> no, uh, it, it's focusing on the few things Absolutely. that make a difference uh, and uh, letting go of all the big things you think you should be doing, but they don't actually make that big a difference. Uh, and uh, now, uh, in our business, where I've got three associates who uh, join me and we work together, and it's a joy. Uh, to be working with great people from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, in a professional backgrounds, uh, uh, kind of manual backgrounds, doesn't matter. These are people who are coming to us because they have a desire to have yeah. a better life. Yeah. Well, it sounds to me that the one thing that I can hear about you is about you have great resilience. Um, you know, even the life, your life before your three heart attacks. I mean, that's a lot to go through. And yet here you are with me talking about it today. So what would you say was the most challenging thing for you to overcome after any of the three heart attacks? For me personally, uh, I would say uh, the physical part, because I'm not really one of those sporty people. And uh, so uh, making sure that I got the exercise that I should have was important. And uh, the third one, which was the smallest of the heart attacks in a way, was the one that was the hardest because I felt physically it taken a bit of a toll on me. And uh, it took me a lot longer to recover from that one than I felt you know, from the others, I guess in that because I had to really just focus on getting out there. And in my case, walking. Uh, and because that attack happened uh, late summer, uh, going into the winter, it became harder and harder to go out into the cold air because uh, I find it harder to uh, breathe uh, deeply yeah. in that uh, condition, and which meant that uh, I couldn't actually go out and walk as much as I'd like to. And uh, for a while, I did kind of uh, slide back. Uh, and uh, I had to stop all my gym work uh, after the heart attack because of all of that. And uh, it's taken me a while to get back into exercising regularly uh, and uh, eating as well, because uh, that, that self-maintenance, uh, I admit I'm not the best person out, but it's not just the one thing, it's doing a number of things. And if you're bad at one thing, as long as you're doing the others, you, you know, generally speaking, you're okay. And uh, what I see is sometimes people get consumed in doing everything, when it's not yeah. about everything. Uh, uh, you, you know, there, there are some things you're gonna be good at, there are some things you're not gonna be as good at, and you just focus on those. Well, uh, in the way in which uh, you can. And Sanjay, I'm with you. I found the exercise one of the most difficult things to bring back. And the weirdest yeah. thing is, I always used to do masses of exercise, but on your recovery yeah. and the gen you know building up of the walking, I have to say I'm lucky I have a dog, so I have the motivation to go out. Yeah. But I'm sure a lot of other people yeah. feel very much the same. They can do stuff, but not uh, and, <laughs> uh, all of it. And you'll recognise also that you become hyper vigilant about your body. You notice the tiniest change in your body after mm -hmm. a heart attack because some part of you is looking out for another attack. And so the slightest thing that changes, you're onto it. That's you notice right. it. I agree there as well. So you mentioned, I've asked you about what was the most difficult thing. What would you say were some tips that you could share with people listening today about what's helped you in your recovery in any area after any of the different heart attacks that you've had? Yeah. For me, the greatest one uh, by far, uh, and it, you know, it, it's the, the nature of the work I do, uh, is the emotional intelligence because we're not taught that in the schools. We're not taught that in the colleges, we're not taught that in the universities. 
if it is mentioned, it's a token mention. And even medics don't really have a clue about it. I have several clients who are doctors and who are, who are highly qualified medical people who I teach about emotional mm -hmm. intelligence because they're not taught. And yet it has a radical impact. You know, we have more than one intelligence. There's a mind intelligence, there's a body intelligence, and there's emotional intelligence. And emotions dictate so much of what we do and how we do it. Uh, so for me, that's been the biggest, to learn about emotional intelligence, but also learn about it in the way that I was fortunate enough to come about it, because most of what's being taught isn't emotional intelligence. It's more of the mind intelligence, which is what our education system is based on being taught uh, in the badge of emotional intelligence, but it's not emotional intelligence. It's just another reworking of the mind. Uh, and uh, that's been probably the number one Can thing. Can you describe for us for what emotional intelligence actually is? I know it's a vast subject, but in a nutshell, because a lot of people may not really understand yeah. what that is. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We are used to using our minds. We are not used to using our emotions. We are used by our emotions. So when we feel great, we can take good quality action. We, you know, we're okay. When we don't feel so great, we make bad decisions out of that and take bad actions. So Feeling great enables you to achieve more than feeling bad. But most of us are waiting to feel great before we uh, do anything. So because the majority of people are pushing down all the bad feelings, it's still impacting them. It's still impacting the quality of the actions that they take, but they're not aware of it. And so they go about, and you might set, say, uh, set a goal of, uh, uh, achieving something uh, and uh, you're doing all the right things but you're doing them from a place in which your energy isn't the best it could be so if i put it this it, it, uh, most people would understand that with cars and whether uh, and i'll talk about petrol cars that the faster you drive and the higher the gear you're in the more miles per gallon you get right yeah uh, so, yeah, so, in the, so the, high, the, the important thing is the gear. The higher the gear, the faster you can get to your destination, and you also get more miles per gallon, which means you burn less fuel. Emotions are fuel, and they're also the gear. So the gear that you're driving your vehicle, your body in, is impacted by the emotion that you're feeling. So in regards to recovery after a cardiac event um, or living with heart disease, I can really see that working because I was thinking about me taking a walk. It's like if I'm feeling really like meh, I'm doing it because I have to. I'm not really going to go and do it. I've got not got the motivation to get off yeah. of my chair, uh, but yeah. but changing yeah. my mindset and my yeah. emotional state about it actually, if I can turn yeah. it into something that is enjoyable and pleasurable and is also helping recovery too. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing is, a lot of people, if not most people, post an event like this will be living in fear. And fear is a low yes. gear. In, in the equivalent of the car, it would be first gear. So you're driving around your life in first gear, wondering why you're not being able to get in anywhere and you're not able to achieve the health goals and uh, the weight goals and whatever else that uh, you've been yeah. advised to do. It, 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 it's gonna be really hard work from fear because you'll be burning far more energy and fuel from there than you would if you were, say, in courage. It's really interesting because for me, I, I had a lot of fear after my heart attack. I I was in shock um, and listening to you, it's like, yeah, I was in first gear, which was why your telephone call with me, whatever it was you said, because I can't remember the content, actually shifted me up yeah. a gear or so and shifted yeah. me into the direction that I am in, in today. So. Yeah. And that's the nature of my work. Everything I do is teaching you to do something internally. Nobody on the outside does needs to have a clue what you're doing. It's all internal. And, and so when I work with people, it's usually conversational. They don't even know what's happened, but they know. But I've taught them what to do in, inside themselves, 
so that they are in a far better position to live the lives that they deserve. Well, thank you very much. You certainly did that for me. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with us about your cardiac event, your three heart attacks, and how your emotional well-being has been important in your recovery? Number one, if you had a cardiac event or you've been advised that you have coronary artery disease or anything related to the heart, is look on that, not as a negative, but as a positive, in the sense that it's giving you an opportunity to live a happier life. On the surface, it may not seem that way. I'm not saying it's, you know, you just kind of wake up one morning and decide that uh, you can have a better life. There are things you're going to have to do. There are changes you're going to have to make. But I can honestly say that uh, since the first attack, which was in 2007, so uh, what's that, uh, 13, 14 years ago now? I've lived more than I did in the previous 40 years of my life. I've had more fun, more enjoyment, more fulfillment. Uh, I work with amazing people. Uh, and I can't even call it work. Uh, I'm living a, a, the life in, in a way that I dreamed of, which is I don't work very much. I get paid quite well because of the business I've built, uh, and building that business wasn't really hard work. A lot of this was due uh, to having a cardiac yeah. event and surviving yeah. and uh, thriving. Absolutely. It, yeah, it was reevaluating what was really important to me. Cool. And then making a decision, if I was going to live, it had to be worthwhile. And the only way it was going to be worthwhile was if I had the life that I desired, not the one that I didn't want, not the hard work. And if you're lucky, go away for two weeks into the sun and then you got to come back to the office and all, all of that. I, you know, people look at me and they, if they don't know me, they go, oh, you know, you're really lucky you can do this. No, I'm... I'm really lucky that I'm alive and I'm really and I'm going to make the most of it every single day I'm going to get the most out of that it's kind of a question yeah. and that and and that doesn't mean that every day is brilliant it doesn't mean that every day is rosy but you finish the day knowing that you've done the best you can yeah, I find myself sometimes thinking is this making the greatest difference to my life is kind of a question that I find asking yeah. I forget like you say there's good days there's bad days but on the whole, that's that's kind of the ethos that I kind of live by. So, and the side effect of all of that is you impact the people around you. As yes, well. that's true. So what would you mean about that, that you affect other people's state of mind and energies? Yeah, they, they, they feed off you. You know, they, they, they pick up your energy. And if you're in a better place, they start to also... Uh, uh, react to that. It's a lovely, a lovely place to stop actually because it is about we feed off each other our energies and our emotions and things like that um, and I'd kind of like to ask you if other people were more interested in finding out about um, the emo emotional intelligence and where they could find you and your work where would they go? Yeah. Um, at the moment uh, the best place is to go to my website which is uh, sanjayshan.tv so s-a-n-j-a-y s-h-a-h dot tv as in television that's excellent and, and uh, just okay, connect with me cool. um, and is there anything before we wrap up that you would like to say that you haven't said already uh, I can be a bit controversial <laughs> in the sense that I truly believe now not, not before all of this, but now, that people who had uh, these sort of things happen to them are some of the luckiest people alive because they've got a chance to make a difference. Excellent. In their life. Well, thank you very much. I, you say it's controversial. I kind of agree with you because it has it turned my life round, um, and you know I love the life I live, as I've said. So thank you very much, Sanjay. Thank you very much for the telephone call that you gave to me many years ago. And thank you very much for sharing everything with me now. Thank you. So that about wraps it up for today. I hope you got some takeaways from today's show. 
You can find all about Sanjay in the show notes where I've listed his contact details. Next week, I have another interview and I'm going to be interviewing Claire Berouche. Claire was nominated in 2020 for the British Heart Foundation Heart Hero Awards. She has contributed in amazing ways to raise awareness of heart failure and has done many TV interviews, been in the national papers and in uh, British Heart Foundation publications. So I hope you join me next week. And until then, bye 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 for now. And remember, if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a five star review and share on your social media. You've been listening to Sally Crawley and the My Heart and Mind podcast. A show for you if you've had a heart attack, cardiac event or other life-changing experience and want to feel good. It's all about mastering your feelings and emotions so you can feel great and live the life you love. To find out more, visit www.myheartandmind.co.uk and note that that's an A-N-D and not the ampersand character. Go be magnificent.